لمحمد خير الشمائل وكامل وهي الدلال السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome once more to our Sira class <coughs> Last thing we were speaking about was the incident whilst the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was a young boy just like any young boy growing up in Mecca he wanted to see what was going on in Mecca he, was, he used to herd sheep he was a shepherd of sheep and of course he used to do this as a job so he was paid and he told his friend that he wanted to go and see what was happening in Mecca. People was having some parties and stuff like that. When he went to Mecca, he said, as soon as the music reached my ear, Allah struck my hearing and I fell down unconscious. I woke up and Everyone was gone. Everything had finished. And he said, well, you know, probably something happened that night. Let, I'll do it another night. So the next night when it came, he told his friend, you know, will you look after my animals, my sheep? And he said, no problem. So he went once more and the same thing happened. There and then he said that, this is a sign from Allah. This is a sign from Allah. Allah is protecting me. So too in the lives of every person, in the life of every person, sometimes Allah uses the means by not giving us something to protect us from some harm. We make dua, and we ask for things because Allah Rabbi Al Azza He says in the Quran, "Udu'uni astajibalakum." Call on me, ask, astajibalakum. I will respond. I will answer you. Sometimes we ask for things and we are not mature enough for it. We are not ready for that. Sometimes we want things in our lives and it, we make du'a for it and it does not come to pass and then we become despondent and we start questioning our iman we start questioning ourselves as a muslim we start even questioning the fact that allah has the ability to answer probably you are not ready yet and sometime later in your life you will receive that it is not that your dua has gone unanswered you are not ready for that as yet and if allah were to give it to you it may cause more harm to you and then you will cry. See, oh, look at what has happened to me. I don't know what I got this, you know, why I got this for, and start cursing, not literally. Start cursing and making remarks, showing a sense of ingratitude to the thing which you ask for. So Allah knows us better than we know our own selves. In another related incident, mentioned by Zaid ibn Haritha radiallahu ta'ala who was a servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said there was a brass idol on one corner of al kaaba and whenever the pagans used to make tawaf every time they make a tawaf they used to touch it the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he told Zaid ibn Haritha he said do not touch the idol now, how come the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knew that he wasn't supposed to touch it? How come he knew to tell Zaid ibn Haritha, do not touch the idol? That was guidance from Allah once more. Allah was protecting him. So Zaid ibn Haritha, he said, as we made another tawaf, now, the pagan Arabs, they used to say Allah. They used to say the word Allah. 
They made tawaf. They made sa'i. They did these things during the days of Hajj. So during our discourse, you will hear me mentioning that Abu Jahal said, By Allah, O oh Allah. And uh, you might ask, ask yourself then, how it is he is saying Allah? The word Ilah means God. It's a proper noun. So it means God. So in their thinking, it is just one, another one of their gods they used to worship. This is how they used to think. It is just another one of their gods. So Zayd ibn Haritha, he said to himself, he said, I told myself, I'm going to touch it to see what will happen. I mean, if you tell someone, I don't want you going there, that is exactly where they're going to go. Isn't that so? You tell a child, I don't want you touching this. And when you just look away, briefly, he touches it. No, we have to feel to, you have to feel to hear or something like that. So Zayd ibn Haritha, he said that, I want, I touched it, I'm, I'm going to touch it just to see what was, you know, what was his response. And he said, I did so. I touched the brass idol and when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw that, he said to him in a high tone, won't you forbidden from touching that? Won't you, did not, didn't I forbid you from touch the, touch the idol? Zayd ibn Haritha, he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never saluted an idol. Even in his youth, growing up, he never saluted an idol right until, up until Allah honored him with nabuwat. And he received revelation. He said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never made sujood to an idol. He never touched it out of reverence. He never even shown or did something that indicated a form of respect towards it. He never did anything to show that, oh, probably, you know, this is the religion of the pagans and I have to respect their religion, so I will show some sign of, you know, gratitude or some sign of, you know, respect towards it. Of course, he did not break it up or anything like that, to, you know, to out of anger or anything like that. But he did not do anything to show reverence in the least towards it. So the pagans would have said, well, Muhammad, we used to see you doing such and such and such with our gods. How come you have changed? Nothing that threw a shade of doubt on his character he would involve himself in. And this is the way of a Muslim. You should not find yourself in places or doing things that may throw some question over your character. You should not involve yourself in anything that may bring doubt in the minds of people about your character. Even being in a place. Because it's easy to be judged. It's very easy to be judged. A person just have to see you heading in a particular direction and they will judge you. Not knowing what, what, what you are going there for. Not knowing what you are doing. They will just judge you immediately. So in the least you should not do something that may cause or bring about doubts in the people mind, people's mind about your character. So he did not do anything in the least so that people in the long run may have something to say. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was like that. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala was just like that. He never touched the idol. He never made sujood to an idol. Because he was brought up in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When things became hard with Abu Talib, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he took Ali ibn Abi Talib under his care. And he, uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala grew up in his household. 
So Allah Rabbul Izzah, He was guiding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam towards something. He was already showing him a direction. Another incident, amongst the people of, amongst the Quraysh, during the days of Hajj, the people used to participate in all the acts and rituals of Hajj except one. They never used to go to Arafah. They never used to go to Arafah. So you have different rituals that used to be performed. You have the Tawaf, the Sa'i, yes. people stand at Arafah, people they go to Mina. They used to do everything except go to Arafah. So that you will participate in every other thing. They will do every other thing besides going to Arafah. Because Arafah, they used to consider Arafah outside of the Haram. So all the other tribes of the Arabs, they would go to Arafah, except the Quraysh. Because the Quraysh, they used to say, we are dwellers of the Haram. How can we go outside of the Haram? This, this was their logic. We are dwellers of the Haram, so we cannot go outside the, this, this, you know, this, the precinct of the Haram. So they will go until the border of Arafah and then they will return. Mut'an ibn Jubayr, once he lost a camel and he went to look for it and he ended up searching for it in Arafah. To his amazement, who does he find sitting in Arafah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Mut'an ibn Jubayr, he said, isn't he from amongst the people of Quraysh? What is he doing here? Because that was, that was the laws of the Quraysh. We are people of the Haram, so we do not go beyond the Haram. We do not go to Arafah. Arafah is outside of the Haram. He is a man of the Quraysh. What is he doing in Arafah? Allah Rabbi Al-Izzah, he was guiding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the fitrah. Allah Rabbi Al-Izzah, he was guiding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the days of Hajj. And he was teaching him something. This is also a part of your Hajj. The common Arab never, common Arabs never used to go. Another very important part of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his early days, his job. Our job has a very serious effect on our lives. Each individual, whatever job he has, it has a very serious effect on our lives. The job of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a, he was a shepherd. He used to shepherd animals. Imam Bukhari, he says in his uh, Jamia, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that Allah has not sent a messenger except that he was a shepherd. His companions, they ask, and you, O Messenger of Allah? He said, yes. He said, I used to herd sheep with a compensation from the people of Makkah. So every Messenger of Allah was a shepherd. It's amazing though, that Allah used this line of work to train His Messengers. Something in society today that is looked down upon. If, I mean, if someone asks you, so what is your job? What is your profession? Say, well, I, um, you know, I herd animals. Say, oh, okay then. As against if you say, well, you know, I work in a ministry of social development and probably you're only packing boxes in the ministry of social development. But the fact to remain that, well, I work in the ministry of social development. Oh, hi. In your mind, he has a fantastic job. You don't even know what he's doing there. You don't even know what he's doing there. But the messenger of Allah was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. And Allah used that line of work to train them. Allah trained the messengers himself. Through the medium, medium of shepherding animals. 
So what can we learn from shepherding animals? Now there are lessons to be learned from shepherding. And there are lessons to be learned from shepherding sheep. It's two different, two different things. Because the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih al-Bukhari specifically mentioned, he said that I used to shepherd sheep. He said I used to shepherd sheep. The most important lesson that they learned, the most important training that they got from being shepherd, firstly was responsibility. Responsibility. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, he says, every person is a shepherd. All of you are shepherds. And all of you will be questioned regarding his flock. The hadith is, it's not a very, very long narration. It, it has some more. And a man is in charge of his household and he will be questioned regarding his household. A woman is in charge of the husband's property and she will be in his absence and she will be questioned with respect to the husband's property. The slave will be questioned with respect to his master's wealth in the absence of the master. The imam is questioned about his jamaat. He will be asked about his jamaat. He is the shepherd of the jamaat. These are lessons for the da'i. Today everyone wants to be an inviter. Imagine a messenger had to be trained to invite people. A messenger had to be trained to invite people towards Islam. You are not inviting people to any and anything. You are not calling. It's easy to call a person to go and watch a movie. That's very easy. But you are calling people towards the religion of Allah. You are calling people towards a thing that will give them salvation. Both in this life and the hereafter. Sometimes the da'i, instead of attracting the people, he chases the people away. He chases the people away. Because he does not possess certain qualities of an inviter. So these are very important lessons for the da'i. Those who are in leadership. Those who wants to be in leadership. Very important. Firstly, responsibility. It teaches them responsibility. They are responsible for the herd even if the herd is not responsible for themselves. And this is how a jamaat is. You have all different types of people the leader has to deal with. People from different backgrounds. People with different types of mentality, temperament. People who are soft. People who are harsh. Different types of people. And the shepherd feels that he's accountable for the flock. He's accountable for a flock, regardless if the flock is intelligent or unintelligent. Whether they are united or not, the, sh the, the shepherd, he is responsible for every animal, every sheep that is under him. So he teaches him, firstly, responsibility because he has to give an account. So the messengers were responsible people. Because they had to give an account for their respected nations. Every messenger will be asked with respect to his nation he was sent to. Secondly, it, teach, it teaches them patience. I mean, taking animals to grace is not an easy task. You know, people think that, well, why you can't just take the animals and just carry them out and just let them loose? Taking sheep to graze, they take their time. They take their time. They're slow. You have to wait on them. You have to be patient. 
He might end up fighting over some water hole or some piece of grass or something. So you have to be patient with him. You have to wait. I mean, you can't really tell the flock of sheep that, well, come on guys, hurry up, you know, we have a schedule to keep times running. Of course, you cannot beat them. So you have to be a patient. So it helps you develop patience. And the messengers of Allah, they learn to be patient with people through this. Imagine having to deal with a person like Abu Jahl. Because, I mean, every page you turn in the life of the messenger of Allah, this character always pops up. It's always there to cause something or to insinuate something or to throw out a bad comment or to poke at something or to cause something in some way to hurt the messenger of Allah. It's always there. Imagine having to deal with a character like that for your whole life. Imagine it. And all you can do is exercise patience. I mean, today when we go to the homes of people to invite them, and you call, I mean, the hadith is that you call three times. If you do not get any response, you go to the next home. Isn't that so? But sometimes we end up calling more than three times. And we see some amazing things. You see shadows in the house moving around. Then you see people peeping through the crease between the curtain. And after about five minutes, now five minutes is a long time. People think five minutes is short. Five minutes is a long time when you have to wait. A very long time. Wait in the KFC line when, you know what I mean? You used to buy, or if you go and stand up in any food line, in any restaurant, wait for five minutes and you will see something. Wait for two minutes and you will start fuming. I mean, you expect fast service because it's fast food. And thereafter, five minutes, then someone emerges and say, well, you know, my husband isn't home. But all the time you were seeing people just running around in the house. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. Thing that no one is seeing them. It's very embarrassing. Next day you have to go back to the same people. After a few weeks, what do you tell yourself? See me, me going back by here now. Man has been inside the house, I don't know what you're doing inside the house, and you go on your call and like nobody at home. All of a sudden everybody vanish. Everybody vanish. You don't want to go back. Imagine a messenger how unbearable it was for him to continuously every day of his life go by the same people give them the same as i mean i mean imagine musa alayhi salam having to deal with the bani israel i mean if if some something miraculous happens in our lives sometimes it transforms our lives we were chronically ill, Allah healed us, so we become a more devout servant to Allah. We start performing our salah more sincerely, more devotedly. We start making an effort towards our Quran. Start reading extra nafil salah. Start waking up for tahajjud. You find yourself always in some form of ibadah, making dhikr, tasbih. All the time. Because Allah has alleviated your problem. You made dua, Allah removed this sickness from you. Imagine the Bani Israel would see food coming out of the clouds. Imagine that. Imagine the Bani Israel standing on one side on the bank of the Red Sea. Witnessing with their own eyes the sea splitting into 12 pathways. And still, at the end of the day, they disbelieved in Allah. I mean, we witness small miracles. And that is only in our lives. Only in our lives. Imagine seeing something like that. 
standing on the shore of a sea, by the sea, witnessing the sea parting. What will you do? Well, besides running, it, it's, you know what I mean, it's shocking. It's magical. It's amazing. And you might stand and stare for a few moments and then run off. Because it's also dangerous. What if it's a tsunami? What if something is happening, some earthquake happened in the sea and I die? But it's amazing because you witness a miracle in the true sense of a miracle. These people witness these miracles and at the end of the day, they still disbelieve and whenever they wanted something, they used to go by Musa alayhi salam and said, Oh Moses, go and tell your Lord. Tell your Lord we want X, Y, and Z. Imagine Musa alayhi salam having to deal with people like this for a very long time. Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam, he preached for 950 years. He lived for over a thousand years. Nuh alayhi salam. Imagine Nuh alayhi salam for 950 years. He had to invite the same people every day, giving them the same message. We go one or two days by a Muslim brother, we get fun up and we don't go back for the next half of a year or next year or something like that. Because why that guy is running around in his house and we are seeing him. It's not like you're not seeing him. You are seeing him. And then someone comes out and say, well, you know the boss man at home and uh, check back tomorrow. Uh, the car park up in the garage and all of a sudden he, you know, I mean, he's not home. That's, that's a mystery. It's a mystery. Noah alayhi salam had to invite the same people because that was his responsibility. Imagine the patience he had to bear dealing with his people for 950 years. Imagine that. You go to the same people, to a person today, tomorrow you have to go back. And the response you will get, tomorrow you might get something worse. Yeah, yeah, man, yesterday, yeah. What I tell you yesterday is the same thing. Uh, I mean, sometimes we get that response. Sometimes brothers, they go to invite Muslims. And I mean, man comes out and he start quarreling and getting on. I mean, it's difficult for a dying sometimes when he invites people. It's difficult. The kind of reaction you get from people but you are not doing this for a wage. And those who are steadfast, they know that they are doing this for the pleasure of Allah. This is Allah's deen. Who is going to take care of Allah's deen? Who will call people and remind people of Allah's deen? No one is signing a check at the end of the month and handing them and say, well, you worked hard this month, you got quarreled prowl, at, people threw something at you, well, take an extra 10 bucks for that, you know? No one pays you for that. That's the responsibility of the Muslims. Uh, Musa alayhi salam, he shepherded for eight or ten years. And uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he wanted to know how long Musa alayhi salam had shepherded for. And he asked Jibreel alayhi salam, how long did Musa alayhi salam work? I mean, he shepherded animals. Remember, he was married to the daughter of Shu'aib alayhi salam. Shu'aib was a messenger of Allah. And Shu'aib was a shepherd. And when he married him, he, had, he told him in exchange that you will shepherd for X amount of years. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he had asked Jibreel alayhi salam, how long Musa alayhi salam shepherd for? And Jibreel alayhi salam, he said he worked for the most complete term. The most perfect term, in other words, it was 10 years. And Musa salam, he went through a lot with the Bani Israel. Nuh salam, went through a lot with his people, the Prophet sallallahu Every messenger that came, they had so much to go through. Sometimes we are confronted with small things and we become very impatient. The third lesson that we learn from shepherding is protection. The shepherd protects his flock. 
The shepherd protects his flock because there are many problems, there are many dangers, seen and unseen, because you have wolves and you have different types of predators always hiding in behind some bush or some tree they are lurking. There are diseases you have to combat. So the shepherd has to be on top of things. He has to be on top of things to ensure that the flock is protected from danger. The Prophet ﷺ, he was a very protective person, very alert. And he tried to protect his people. In fact, a shepherd is trained psychologically, physically and psychologically, they are trained. So the prophets of Allah, they had to be trained with this. Because you have different sheep with different temperament. You have a sheep that just start jumping up and getting on, getting on, and then you have the quiet ones. You always think something is wrong with a quiet one because he's not getting on like the wild ones. And when the wild ones start getting on, you think that something is wrong with a wild one. Why can't he be like the quiet one? So it's a very psychological, tricky situation. So he had to be trained mentally. Mentally. At, at Medina, one night, suddenly there was a huge commotion. There was a huge commotion and the Sahabas, they immediately, they took up their weapons and they got on their horses and they started to head in the direction where they heard the noise coming from. To their amazement, whilst they was on their way, they saw the messenger of Allah already coming back. He was already returning and he was telling them that, you know, everything is okay. You know, everything is fine. You know, don't worry. I already took care of it. He was on top of things. When everyone used to go to sleep in the night, the messenger of Allah used to walk through the streets, just checking out to see how things are. He will walk through the streets and make sure everything is okay. He was very protective over his flock. The fourth lesson. The animals are closer to the earth and their sight is very limited. Animals, whilst they are feeding, they are very close to the earth, so their sight becomes very limited. And any obstacle, any obstacle in front of a sheep can totally block its vision. So it's difficult for a sheep to really uh, see what's coming at it. I mean, when you see green pastures, all you can think about is eating. Isn't that so? Because an animal is always hungry. Always eating. Always chewing its cud. I mean, humans eat and when their bellies are filled, if they see more food, they want to taste it. Isn't that so? You go to a program and they share food, you sit and you eat. When the dessert comes out, you eat. If a different type of dessert comes out after that, you want to eat. I mean, where's all that food going to? And if four types of dessert comes out, you want to sample all four. Isn't that so? Cheap animals, they are low down. They are down on the ground. And so it's the same thing. It's the same thing. That quality of... Uh, Eating, it's a uh, quality of the animals and it's also a quality of man. We love to eat. We love to eat. The animals, whilst they are low, it's difficult for them to see. Because anything in front of them becomes an obstacle and it will block their view. But the shepherd, he stands on a height. He stands on a height and he has to be alert for any uncommon danger to his flock. And the shepherd is the one who will give an advance warning to the herd. So you will have the flock of sheep grazing and they are unaware of dangers that are approaching them. And the shepherd is the one who are on top of the hill. He is the one who is standing. He is the one who is seated on a rock. He is the one who sees the oncoming danger. 
So the prophets, they were trained in foreseeing something. They are trained in such a manner that they know what is good, what is bad for the hood. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he says, he says the analogy of me and you is, it is like someone sitting next to a fire at night. Whilst you are attracted to it, and you are jumping in it, whilst I'm holding you, grabbing you by your clothing, dragging you and pulling you away from the fire, but you are forcing yourself into it. He says, that is the analogy between me and you. It's like we are sitting around a fire. And you are jumping into that fire. You do not know the danger of the fire. I know the danger of it. So I'm pulling you back. I'm holding you. But you are forcing yourself into it. So the messengers of Allah, they know that it is fire. We don't. When the Prophet ﷺ gives instructions, he did not give us instructions because he's trying to cramp his style. How he know what we like and what we don't, know, what don't like? Whenever he gave instructions, he knows why he's given instructions. When Allah gives us instructions, he knows why he's given us instructions. Because of the danger that lies in doing this. But today everyone has their own prerogative. Some people will say, well, I'm not ready for that as yet. Allah says such and such in Quran. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said X, Y, and Z. He said, well, you're not ready for that yet, nah? I too young. And when you grow old, I'm too old for that. So what period in your life would you be ready? It's like Hajj. When you are young and you have the health, you say, well, I am ready for that. That responsibility is too responsible. You know, I'm enjoying myself because Hajj, you know, I'm supposed to be a particular kind of person when I make the Hajj. And if I go for Hajj, then I have to change. And that's bad. I shouldn't become a good Muslim as yet. You know why? Because there are so much other things, bad things that is to do. So I wait until I can't walk properly. Or I'm having some arthritis on my knees. Or I'm having back problems and then I will go for Hajj. Don't wait. You have the means to go for Hajj. Make the Hajj. And do not wait until you reach such an age where it becomes, uh, you know, imp uh, not difficult. It becomes difficult for you. And you go there and you have some problems and you have people always having to forego their needs and the things they want to do to look after you. So the person wants to spend some time in a Nabawi, but they have to look after you because your back is paining or your knee. I, I can't walk down your step and it's so far and the, the tile's so cold and stay with me now. You can't stay with me. I'm feeling lonely. Afraid in this hotel. So high up. All type of excuses. Don't wait. Don't wait. If you have the means to make the hajj, then it becomes compulsory upon you. The Prophet wasallam, he sees the danger for his ummah. So he warns them, don't do this. It is un-Muslim of you to do such and such. Allah does not like this. But today what's the statement that people make is that that is only sunnah. Allah said that in the Quran. That is what you, you would not believe. There are people who make that statement today. People make that statement today. That is, that is only sunnah. Why don't you do such and such? Allah said that in the Quran. Well, no. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that. Well, they, they sunnah, they only sunnah. People have the audacity to make that remark. That is only sunnah. I mean, who are we supposed to follow? 
Who are we supposed to follow? As a Muslim. Today, we look for a role model in life. But we learn that from the unbelievers. Because a Muslim knows who is his role model. He knows who is his role model. But you want to fatigue. Say, well, my role, role model is Roland Dirio. You know, he can play football real good, and you know what I mean? He's a superstar. My role model is this pop star who sings pop songs or reggae or, yeah, that's my role model. Whilst we have the perfect role model, we have the perfect role model, but we are feeling left out if we do not say or call someone name. My role model is this one. So who is your role model, Jack? Well, my role model is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That's bad. I mean, you can't say the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because, I mean, you will be alienated, um, alienated from the group. You want to be a part of the group. Isn't that so? So you say something like that to be a part of the group. So we are looking, Muslims today, look for our role model amongst people. Whilst we have the perfect role model for ourselves. So when we hear, this is the sunnah, or this is what the Prophet of Allah loved, so we should also love it. You say, nah, me yeah, like that, nah. I ain't ready for that, nah. A Muslim. A Muslim, coming from a Muslim, you should be ashamed of yourself. Coming from a Muslim. He is the perfect role model. And look at every aspect of his life and you will see something. You will see something in his life. So he sees the danger and he warns his people. But how many people takes a warning? He says, whilst you are jumping into the fire, I'm holding you and I'm pulling you out of the fire. But you are forcing yourself into the fire. You don't even know that that is fire. He said, I know it is the fire. I know it is the fire. So I'm pulling you away from the fire. Very protective over his flock. Another lesson that we learn from shepherding is simplicity. A shepherd lives a very simple life. And uh, I mean, you can't have all the accessories of life in the desert. You don't see the shepherd carrying his 32 inch or, well today people don't go 32 inch anymore. 40, 46 inch flat screen television. Well, whilst, you know, the animals are grazing, I will look at a movie or two, you know what I mean? It's boring just sitting, looking at all these animals every day. You know, whole day you're doing the same thing. It's the same thing every day. And their favorite couch or their favorite chair and their favorite dish and all their fancy gadgets. You don't see a shepherd taking these things with him. No. He lives a very simple life. If it's raining, you have to take shelter. If your food runs out, you have to satisfy yourself with what you ate until you reach home. So it trains a person. It trains the messengers to live a very simple life. To live a very simple life. So these are just a few of the reasons why Allah had, or why they were shepherds and the training that Allah had given them during the period of time they used to shepherd sheep. Now, why specifically sheep? I mean, you had goats, you had camels, you had cows, you had all different types of animals. Why specifically sheep? We might say that, you know, it wasn't their custom to shepherd cows. We might say that. And why 
we might say also, well, you know, there were camels also, and uh, it wasn't their custom to shepherd camels, you know what I mean? But there were shepherds of cows. There were shepherds of goats. Abu Ma'abad, her husband, carry out, carried out the flock of goats to graze. So amongst the Arabs, you had people. But the messengers in particular, why shepherd sheep? Sheep are, sheep are very weak animals. They are very weak. They are weaker than cow. They are weaker than goat. They are weaker than... In fact, they are the weakest of the pack. And they need more attention. They need more protection. They need more care. They need more looking after. Because of their weakness, they could easily fall prey to the predator. And if you look at the narrations of the Prophet ﷺ, when he warned us about breaking off from the Jamaat, which animal did he use? Which animal did he use? Did he say, well, do not become like the goat when he breaks off from the flock? Or did he say, well, don't become like the buffalo or the camel or the cow when they breaks away from the herd of cows did he say that he said the sheep he used the sheep because the sheep it's an animal like you know wherever you know the grass greener on the other side well they has this mentality the grass is always greener on the other side so if they see a patch of nice luscious green grass they will run over to that area and when they reach if they see something better, they will just keep on going. They are weak. Their aql is short. So the Prophet wasallam, he wanted to warn us of shaitan. He wants to warn us of shaitan. And what did he say? He brought in his experience. He said, stick with the jama'ah. Stick with the jama'ah. Be with the group, keep close to the group of the Muslim, the major body of the Muslim, because the wolf eats up the stray sheep. When you break away from the Jamaat, and you know, sometimes we think that I can handle them for less than MD, them doing all kind of thing, I'm gonna do my own thing. And we think that we are doing a good, and we say, I'm trying to protect myself from shaitan. Guess what? He's always 10 steps smarter than you. He just caught you. Because the Messenger of Allah said, keep with the jamaat. Stick with the body of the Muslim. But you think you are better off alone. That is going against the sunnah. But we think that what we are doing is something good. We think that it's a good thing. But that is what shaitan wants. So he caught you. Whilst you profess your iman and your love for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and your obedience, strict obedience to Allah and his laws. Whilst you profess these things and you think that shaitan does not have the upper hand in me. When you do that, he caught you and you don't even know he caught you. You don't even know. It's like a man in salah and he listens to some bayan on khushu, concentratedness in salah. And when he starts his salah, he says, well, shaitan, I'm going to catch me again. And guess what he starts thinking? Well, the Maulana, he said, you know, we have to be concentrated in salah, so I'm going to be. And he starts thinking like this. I have to be very focused in my salah. You have to be concentrated in salah. Shaitan caught you. He caught you. You are thinking that you are going to be focused in your salah. And what you are thinking of something outside of salah. So he caught you. He's very wise very intelligent he knows he knows how to trap a muslim 
ex an expert, an expert in traps. So he said, stick to the Jamaat. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, stick to the Jamaat. Those who leave the Jamaat. What did he say? When you leave the Jamaat, you will get eaten up. Just by shaitan. Just as the stray wolf, just as the stray sheep gets eaten up by the wolf. It is never a good thing when you leave the Jamaat. Do not ever think that you are doing a good. Never ever think that. Because the hand of Allah, the mercy and the barakah of Allah is always on the jamaat. The help of Allah is always on the jamaat. There is another very important thing that we learn. Sometimes we are affected by the environment that we work in. And our work have a very powerful influence on us, especially on our personality. Shepherds of sheep, they are different from shepherds of camels and of goats, of uh, cows. Sheep tend to be a very compassionate animal, quiet, very docile, compassionate. I always think they're humble and, you know, always looking like they have a smile on their face. Sheep are like that. You go next to a goat, he wants to butt you. Goat is always trying to run you down or something like that. Worse yet, you're not going around a bull or a cow. Afraid they get trampled upon or something like that. So the shepherd learns to be merciful and kind with his flock. He learns to be compassionate with his flock. Just as a shepherd learns compassion from being a shepherd of sheep, he learns compassion and mercy from being a shepherd of sheep. Similarly, why, when he has to carry out the task and the responsibility and of spreading the message of Allah in the same manner, he has to be compassionate and merciful towards the people. Someone abused you today. Tomorrow you go by, you have to go back by the same person. He will abuse you again. And we all know the incident of the woman who used to sweep her house and then throw the dust on the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, something, sometimes we ask ourselves, I mean, where is she getting all that dust from? You remember they are living in the desert and the wind is always blowing and the dust will, you know, it will get blown inside the house. So she always had dust in her house. There was always dust in her house. I mean, there wasn't people like us today who have sealed windows. Some of their houses only had a curtain, a piece of cloth covering the window. So uh, during the day, they opened the windows so that the wind can blow in because the place was very hot. So dust will, and she will sweep the house, gather it, and wait. And when the messenger of Allah will pass, she will wait for the right moment and throw the dust on his head. Imagine having to put up with that. Imagine someone is always throwing something in our path, always punching the tire in our cars, always doing something. Your neighbor is always throwing something in your gateway. How would you react? How did the messenger of Allah react? One day he passed and he didn't get any dust on his head, so he stood there for a moment. And you know, I mean, where's the dust? And he started to see people going in and coming out and going in. So he asked, you know, well, what's the problem? And he said, the woman who lives on the upper apartment, she fell ill. And he went to visit her. I mean, what would you say? I hope she did. <laughs> yeah. No more dust on my head. That is it. The end. Thank God, <laughs> Allah alleviated my problems. We, we make remarks like that. What did he do? He went and he visited her. Isn't that so? The woman who he helped with her baggage. I mean, if someone, we help them with their baggage, and from the moment we start carrying their baggages, they start speaking about you. So, well, you know, that guy named Muhammad, 
Yeah, he's a really bad guy. Notorious character. Notorious character. Don't get mixed up with him. How long you, you are Muhammad? I mean, a trainee will drop that bag right here. Say, look, tote your bundle on your own, yes? Helping you and you. Bad mouthing me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he took the woman's baggage until she reached her destination. And then she said, by the way, son, what's your name? He said, I'm Muhammad, the same person you were speaking about all along. I am, I am that person. I am that character. That bad character who you don't want to get mixed up with. I am that bad person whom everybody is bad mountain today. I am that Muhammad. He learned to be merciful. He learned it's striking though. That one of Allah's qualities is Ar Rahman. It's amazing. One of Allah's greatest qualities is Ar Rahman, the most merciful. How can we learn mercy? Except having someone show us how to be merciful. How can we learn mercy if we do not get a practical example? Of what and how we should be mercy, merciful. When the Prophet Sallallahu he conquered Makkah, and the Quraysh they were running from here to there and fleeing for their lives, and they were running all over. And they were saying, "Today Muhammad has conquered Makkah. We are doomed." I mean, inshallah, it's time for the Adhan and to continue. We'll continue this this incident next week inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh لمحمد خير الشمائل وكامله